Welcome back. This is part three of the video lecture series on the international law of the sea. Here is what has been covered in parts one and two. And these are the issues that will be addressed in this video. Let's first talk about the different maritime zones coastal states can claim based on the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. Such claims result in what we can call maritime real estate. It's all about coastal states' exclusive rights to the exploitation of resources in the sea areas near their coasts. Such exclusive rights can clash with other priorities in the use of the oceans, namely with free navigation and with the protection of the marine environment. In addition, coastal states' claims to offshore zones can give rise to maritime border disputes with neighboring states. To explain the different maritime zones, let me use this virtual blackboard and try to decorate it with a maritime landscape in a coast area. Here it is. It's not a fun goch. It's just from me. But I hope it will serve its purpose to make things clear. So looking at that landscape, what kind of zones does the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea provide for and how does it regulate them? All the different zones refer to the baseline, which normally corresponds to the low water line along the coast. This is where we have to start. Water areas that are located landwards from the baseline, such as bays and harbours, are so-called internal waters. They are fully under the sovereignty of the coastal state. Internal waters are just part of the state territory. Looking seawards from the baseline, we first have the territorial sea, which extends to up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline. In this zone, the coastal state can claim full jurisdiction and control, with the exception that it has to respect the right to innocent passage, meaning that foreign ships are allowed to sail through those waters under the conditions of innocent passage, which will be discussed shortly in this video. The territorial sea also marks the outer limit of national airspace. The next zone that the coastal state can claim is the contiguous zone extending to up to 24 nautical miles from the baseline. Here the coastal state does not have full jurisdiction but may enforce certain kinds of national law rules, in particular customs law, which for instance allows for law enforcement against smugglers. However, the maritime zone that is the most important by far is the exclusive economic zone, the EEZ, whose outer limit is 200 nautical miles from the baseline, which is around 370 kilometers. The EEZ is the most valuable part of a coastal state's maritime real estate, since it gives it the exclusive right to exploit the living and non-living resources in the water, on the seabed and in the subsoil. This includes the fish stocks in the water column, so if you want to catch a fish here, you would need to ask the coastal state for a permit. The coastal state's exclusive rights also include the exploitation of mineral resources in the subsoil underneath the ocean waters, namely offshore oil and gas fields. So if you want to drill for that oil here, you would need a license from the coastal state. If underwater geography allows for it, that is to say, if there is a continental shelf extending even farther than 200 nautical miles from the baseline, coastal states can make additional claims to that continental shelf. However, such claims need to be accepted by a special commission, the Commission on the Limits of the Continental Shelf. Moreover, the maximum extension of continental shelf rights is 350 nautical miles from the baseline. And beyond the EEZ, the continental shelf rights of the coastal state are also restricted to the exploitation of mineral resources in the subsoil. The ocean waters above the continental shelf are part of the high seas where no exclusive rights to fisheries can be claimed. Here, as for all of the high seas, Article 89 of the UN Convention applies, according to which no state may validly purport to subject any part of the high seas to its sovereignty. The deep seabed that is beyond the reach of the rights of coastal states is what is called the area with the capital A in the international law of the sea. We will soon come back to this term. 
by giving coastal states such extensive rights in broad maritime zones along their coasts, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea has put in place the legal framework for the creation and acquisition of large amounts of high-value maritime real estate. The aggressive claims to offshore zones and resources that many states have made since the middle of the 20th century have been sanctioned in the 1982 UN Convention to a very large extent, most importantly by the recognition of a generous 200 miles exclusive economic zone. The result is what you can see on the map. The exclusive economic zones claimed by coastal states around the globe, in light blue on the map, add up to quite a large proportion of the oceans. And notice, even tiny islands in the middle of the oceans are capable of creating large EEZs all around them. Thanks to the UN Convention, coastal states have been able to expand their jurisdiction and control to large ocean areas. In that sense, the Convention has probably sanctioned the largest territorial grab in history. Despite the increased focus on coastal states' rights in the sea areas along their coast, free navigation also remains a central concern for current maritime law. In Article 87, behind which we can clearly recognize Hugo Grotius if we look carefully, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea explicitly guarantees freedom of navigation. In addition, the Convention also offers precise rules on passage through territorial waters and straits, which is how the Convention deals with potential conflicts between the rights of coastal states and free navigation. In principle, a coastal state has full jurisdiction and control over its territorial sea extending to up to 12 nautical miles from the baseline. However, it cannot prevent foreign ships from sailing through those waters. Article 17 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea says that ships of all states enjoy the right of innocent passage through the territorial sea. However, this right is limited to mere passage, and such passage must be innocent. Those two notions are defined in the following two articles, 18 and 19. According to Article 18, Passage means navigation through the territorial sea in order to traverse it or reach a port. As stated in paragraph 2, such passage shall be continuous and expeditious, without stopping or anchoring, at least in principle, some exceptions being narrowly defined in the second sentence of paragraph 2. But above all, the passage must be innocent, that is to say, it must not be prejudicial to the peace, good order or security of the coastal state. This is specified in paragraph 2 of Article 19, which lists a number of specific activities that are incompatible with innocent passage. Top of the list is, of course, the threat or use of force against the sovereignty, territorial integrity or political independence of the coastal state. In the same logic, no exercise or practice with weapons is permitted. Neither is it allowed to engage in any activity aimed at collecting information relevant for the defense or security of the coastal state, in other words, spying. Prohibited is also the loading and unloading of any commodity, currency or person contrary to the customs, fiscal, immigration or sanitary laws and regulations of the coastal state. That is to say, any smuggling in or out of goods, money or people. Further, willful and serious pollution is affecting the innocence of the passage as well. And so are fishing activities. The last subparagraph shows us that the list is not exhaustive. It makes it clear that also any other activity not having a direct bearing on passage is incompatible with the required innocence of the passage. Even more important than the rules on innocent passage are those on straight passage. Straits that connect different parts of the oceans are essential for free navigation and trade. Much of worldwide maritime traffic passes through straits such as the Strait of Gibraltar, connecting the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea, the Strait of Hormuz, connecting the Indian Ocean and the Persian Gulf, or the Strait of Malacca, connecting the Indian Ocean and the South China Sea. 
The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea regulates straight passage in similar terms as innocent passage. However, as you can see in Article 38, straight passage is not limited to navigation, it also includes overflight. Paragraph 1 states that in straits, all ships and aircraft enjoy the right of transit passage. And paragraph 2 adds that transit passage means the exercise of the freedom of navigation and overflight. Articles 38 and 39 also specify the conditions, namely that the transit passage shall be continuous and expeditious, that the ship or aircraft shall proceed without delay through or over the strait, that it shall refrain from any threat or use of force, and that it shall refrain from any activities other than those incident to their normal modes of continuous and expeditious transit. Let us now turn to the marine environment, which needs to be managed and protected. What is at stake here are common interests of all of the world population, including future generations. It's about managing and protecting the common living spaces and the common resources to be found in the ocean areas that are beyond the jurisdiction and control of coastal states. In that context, the area with a capital A is an important point of reference. Article 1, paragraph 1 offers a definition according to which area means the seabed and ocean floor and subsoil thereof beyond the limits of national jurisdiction. The core principle applying to the area with a capital A is the common heritage principle. Article 136 of the UN Convention explicitly states that the area and its resources are the common heritage of mankind. And Article 137 specifies that no state shall claim or exercise sovereignty or sovereign rights over any part of the area or its resources, nor shall any state or natural or juridical person appropriate any part thereof. No such claim or exercise of sovereignty or sovereign rights, nor such appropriation shall be recognized. To manage and protect this common heritage of mankind, the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea has established the ISA, the International Seabed Authority, which has its headquarters in Kingston, Jamaica. If you want to learn more about the ISA, check out this video presentation. However, the challenge to manage and protect the marine environment is not restricted to the area. A probably even bigger challenge is the protection of the ocean waters and the incredibly rich ocean life. But while this huge and urgent task is addressed in Chapter 12 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea and in a whole range of other treaties, not nearly enough is currently being achieved. Pollution, overexploitation, and the destruction of whole ecosystems are continuing and probably even worsening. To get a sense of the challenges ahead, I invite you to take a look at those statements by world famous marine biologist, Dr. Sylvia Earle. We have one final point to discuss, dispute resolution. International maritime law regularly gives rise to various kinds of disputes between states, including maritime border conflicts, clashes over free navigation and disputes about environmental issues. Which court or tribunal shall settle such disputes? The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea offers several options. As we know, enforcement can be quite problematic in international law. One reason for this is that, as a general rule, international courts, unlike national courts, do not have mandatory jurisdiction. Generally, an international court is competent to deal with a case only if the state parties involved have agreed to submit their dispute to that court. However, in the International Law of the Sea, the 1982 UN Convention has taken a new approach. It has put in place a system of compulsory dispute settlement procedures capable of leading to final and binding decisions. While not perfect, this is a remarkable attempt at improving the enforceability of international law rules. To begin with, 
The United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea recalls the principle stated in Article 2, Paragraph 3 of the UN Charter, namely that states shall settle their disputes by peaceful means rather than resorting to armed conflict. Further, the Convention recalls that state parties always remain free to agree to settle disputes arising between them by any peaceful means of their choice. Yet for cases where such an agreement on specific ways of dispute settlement proves impossible, the Convention provides for compulsory procedures, which means that any party can bring a dispute before an international court or an international tribunal without needing to ask the other party for its consent. The question of precisely which court or tribunal has jurisdiction for a specific case depends on the choices the state parties involved had made when they had ratified the Convention. Article 287 offers basically three options from which each state needs to choose at least one in a written declaration that accompanies its ratification of the Convention. The options are the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, the International Court of Justice and general or special arbitration, with arbitration being the default option if the choices made by the state parties involved in a dispute don't provide the basis for the competence of the International Tribunal of the Law of the Sea or the International Court of Justice. The system might seem rather complicated and somewhat problematic. Obviously, uniform and consistent interpretation and application of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea is not facilitated by the fact that different courts and tribunals deal with the same types of disputes. Yet this was the price that had to be paid to make the concept of compulsory procedures acceptable within the international community. Being offered a range of options makes it easier for states to submit to compulsory litigation or arbitration. And the options look quite appealing, don't they? The International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea is a specialized international court located in Hamburg, Germany. It is composed by 21 experienced judges who are experts in maritime law. The International Court of Justice in The Hague is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, with 15 judges elected by the UN General Assembly and the UN Security Council. Arbitral tribunals are constituted according to Annex 7 or Annex 8 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. They also do an excellent job, particularly in solving complicated maritime border disputes. An example is the award rendered by an arbitral tribunal in 2014 on a long-standing maritime border dispute between India and Bangladesh. The arbitral award successfully ended a 40 years conflict, which is quite an achievement given that disputes about territory have a considerable potential to lead to armed conflict. Article 288 of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea makes it clear that the court or tribunal that is competent based on Article 287 has jurisdiction over the case and thus has the power to interpret and apply the convention in order to settle the dispute. If jurisdiction is disputed between the parties, the court or tribunal will first take a decision on that preliminary question before it proceeds to the merits of the case. Once jurisdiction is established, the court or tribunal has the power to render a final decision that is binding for the parties and shall put an end to their dispute. There would be so much more to discuss and explore about the international law of the sea. But let me stop here for now. Thank you for watching.